Hey, thanks for joining us here today at Victory Church, where we invite people to belong before they believe. If you want to know more about who we are and what we do, or if any of our messages have impacted your life and you would like to partner with us in giving to this ministry, we invite you to do so by visiting our website at victory.church. Now, let's check out this week's message from our lead pastor, John Chesty. Hey, what's up, Victory Church? Let's make some noise for Jesus to start today, amen? It's so good to be here. It's so good to be at the Edmond campus with you guys. Uh, so uh, uh, proud of the Edmond campus and all the things God's doing through Pastor Wade, Pastor Cameron's leadership and the whole team there. Those of you watching online, we're so honored that you would join us. I've met somebody this past week uh, in the DFW metro area when I was serving at the Kings uh, that, it, that lives down there, but they call this their home church. They watch every week. So we, we know that we have family out there and we're so thankful and we, we, we're honored that you would join us today. I'm actually not supposed to be preaching today. So um, I was actually scheduled to be off and Pastor Oscar was gonna preach and he was gonna bring a great word, I know. And uh, we had some, last week I preached a message about doing hard things and I got a ton of feedback from it, which was, which was all good, hopefully, you know, Maybe you gave bad feedback and I just didn't hear it. That's possible too. But um, Pastor Oscar and I went to coffee this week and he said, hey, we're having some things with worship and, and I'm gonna have to lead worship at the OKC campus this weekend. And he says, do you think you could maybe preach this coming Sunday? And God had already started kind of stirring in my heart a part two to last week's message. And um, I want real quick, I wanna give like a test. Okay, here's a test. and This will tell me who was here last week and who wasn't, all right? So a quick test, Edmund Campus, you guys participate too. If it were easy, oh, quite a few of you are here, that's good. Um, if you weren't here, you can go back and watch it. This is, a, this is kinda like Top Gun, you can watch part two without watching the first one, okay? You probably kinda get the gist after a little while. Uh, but I preached a sermon last week called Paul, Paul's Strength. We looked at the strength that God had given Paul, and we saw that God had given Paul a strength to do hard things. And we talked about how sometimes we can pray for miracles and we love that God is a miracle working God. We just sang about it. But sometimes God doesn't part the waters. Sometimes he gives us the strength to build a boat. And what do we do in those times? And I believe that God is calling on the children of God because I think there's some hard times coming. I think God is, is calling us to become really good at doing hard things. And we identified those things last week. Maybe God's challenging you to go back to school Maybe he's challenging you to start a business. Maybe he's uh, challenging you to work on your marriage, work on your relationship with the Lord, work on you know relationship with kids. Whatever it is, we're all challenged to do hard things. Many of you are in the middle of it. You're in the middle of doing hard stuff. You're raising kids, that's hard, right? You're in the middle of it. Other times God prompts us and challenges us to do something hard. And that's what I wanna talk about today. I kinda wanna pick up where we left off. Today I'm gonna talk about a different character in the Bible. If you look close enough, you'll find that God gave pretty much everybody in the Bible courage and strength to do hard things. Uh, my favorite book of the Bible, I'll just put it out there, put it on record. You're like, John, I've heard you say that before about different books of the Bible. But this truly is one of my favorite books of the Bible is the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah is a, is a really good leadership book. If you're a business leader, um, I would encourage you to read the story of Nehemiah and pick up a lot of really great leadership traits uh, in, in, in the book of Nehemiah. But Nehemiah is a really powerful book that I want us to lean into today because what I wanna point out about Nehemiah, the book of Nehemiah, is Nehemiah is a book where there are no miracles. Um, many times in the scriptures you will see God will show up to, to Moses, God will show up to Elijah. God will show up to various people all through the scriptures and the Lord will speak. Like he met Moses at a burning bush and they had a conversation. Nehemiah, God does not speak. There is no spoken word. There, there is no miracles. And you might be like, well then why do you like that book so much? Because it is a, it is, Nehemiah is a story of ordinary people praying to an extraordinary God and doing amazing things for God without miracles. 
And we can relate to this, right? Sometimes it's easy for us to just sit back and wait on God to move, wait on God to do a miracle for us. And I'm thankful that many times he does, and I believe we serve a miracle-working God. But I also think there are times that God is challenging us, that God is not gonna do a miracle for us. Sometimes God wants to do a miracle through us. And we are the miracle for someone else. So God wants his people to become a people that aren't afraid and that we have the strength to do hard things. I wanna show you one of my favorite verses in the whole story of Nehemiah that God really spotlighted for me. It's in Nehemiah chapter two. You can flip over there with me, Nehemiah chapter two. It's on you version. You can follow along in my notes and actually add your own notes and copy and paste those and email them to yourself for later. You version's a great tool for that. We can thank Life Church and Pastor Craig for that. It's an amazing tool. Or you have your Bible or you can just chill, sit back, relax and watch the screen. All right, Nehemiah chapter two, verse 11. This is Nehemiah speaking. He says, I went to Jerusalem, and after staying there three days, I set out during the night with a few others. And this is the sentence I'm gonna lean into today. Nehemiah said, I had not told anyone what my God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. It wasn't this moment that the bush was burning and Nehemiah said, what was that? And God said, thus saith the Lord. And Nehemiah was like, no. It wasn't like it was for Gideon, And all these moments, it was something that God had subtly, softly spoken or put a seed in Nehemiah's heart. And this seed that God had placed in his heart propelled him, and that's what I wanna talk about today, propelled him into doing really, really hard things with no manifestation of miracles from God. God didn't show up and build this wall. It was ordinary people doing ordinary things to do something extraordinary for the Lord. And I wanna lean into this today. The title of my message is, we're to, this week we're gonna lean on Nehemiah's strength, and we're gonna discover how the strength to do hard things with no miracles. With no miracles. Uh, again, I'm, a, I'm an advocate of miracles. Please don't misunderstand me. I'm, God, I'm not saying I don't want miracles. Don't, don't misunderstand me. I am wel- welcoming them, I'm for them. But what do we do when the miracle doesn't show up? but there's still something that God has placed in our heart to do. God is challenging us to do hard things for the Lord. I I am amazed, I love miracles in the Bible, but I actually think some of the biggest miraculous stories to me are stories where there are no miracles. Uh, I was talking to uh, Doug Hall, he attends our church and he attends the OKC campus and he, he, several years ago, he battled leukemia had a death sentence, was not expected to live. And we were actually having coffee just the other day and he is now celebrating five years of of defying what the doctor said. And we were just kind of talking through this and and (laughs) although you can look at segments of his, his story and find miracles, there was no miraculous healing. There was no, he woke up one day and he was healed. There was no, Jesus moment where he touched the blind and they saw or raised, you know, made the lame to walk or made the death to, death, 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 uh, dead, dead to rise. He went through the process. He had a bone marrow transplant. He went through the course and the hardship and the struggle. And what he discovered is that the, the series of having no necessarily manifestations of miracles, God worked a miracle in the process. I like to call these the the mile walking miracle. That the miracle actually happens while you walk it out. Many times we wanna wait for the miracle to manifest before we decide to start walking. But I think sometimes it's the hard work that triggers this. And and Pastor Oscar kind of brought this to my attention as we were talking through this at coffee earlier this week. And he threw it at me that I had to preach this week. Thank Pastor Oscar. But we were talking through this idea and he brought this, 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 this forth to me and it was such a good word. And he made the, the point to say that, John, think about John the Baptist. John the Baptist came on the scene to prepare the way for Jesus. John the Baptist n- never experienced a miracle and he never, probably never even saw a miracle. But when Jesus was concluding John the Baptist's life, he said, there has never been anyone greater to come from a woman than John the Baptist. Jesus looked at John the Baptist, the guy who had never seen a miracle, never performed a miracle, and said, that's the greatest man that's ever came from the womb of a child, of a mother. 
So the process of this, to think through, how do we do these things when there are no miracles? In fact, Jesus, I, I, I came across this verse in my studies in John 20. Jesus said, blessed are those who have never seen, but still believe. So what do we do when we don't see miracles, but we still believe that God can do, still do something miraculous? There's two words that I wanna kinda hone in on that are kind of become a broad theme of this story that I think if you look close enough, you'll see this in your story too, the story of Nehemiah. The first thing you see kind of pop up in the story of Nehemiah is Nehemiah is kind of abruptly presented with concern. He hears about what is happening and, and that the fact that the walls have still not been erected in Nehemiah. Let me show this to you. It's in Nehemiah chapter one, verse three. It says, they said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. Now watch verse four. When I heard these things, I sat down and I wept. Like it was the concern of it all. The concern is the thing that you're concerned about. I'm concerned about my marriage. I'm concerned about my finances. I'm concerned about my career. I'm concerned about my weight. I'm concerned about whatever it is. And it's the concern that will compel you. It's the, in fact, it's the concern that urges you to do hard things. If you didn't have a concern for it, you wouldn't even consider doing hard things. But there's something that's concerning to you. And this concern, if you'll allow it to, your concern will actually shape your mission and your vision and your values. The concern for it will compel you to want to create a vision to overcome it. And you see this happening. Now I want to show you one, one quick thing before I skip on. So Nehemiah says that in verse one and, one and four, and at the end of verse four, I wanna show you his response. So he was concerned, he wept, and then and the very next sentence says, for some days I mourned and fasted and prayed. I want you to notice what his concern compelled him to do first. He didn't say, we gotta fix this, let's go build the wall. The very first thing his concern brought him to was to the foot of his Lord. He was mourning, he fasted, you know, we forget about fasting. I preached a sermon on this a couple years ago about the power of fasting. It's one of the greatest weapons we have as believers. And if fasting was easy, so he fasted and he prayed. That's the first thing he did. His concern drove him to this. The second thing that's kind of a theme in this story, won't you write this word down? So it's one, you have a concern. Two, you will be presented with a conflict. Conflict. Conflict is the thing that keeps you from doing the hard thing. Conflict is the what if. Conflict is the what if I fail? What if I file for bankruptcy? What if that doesn't go the way I thought it would do? And so every concern is abruptly presented with a conflict. And the conflict is the thing that keeps you from wanting to do the hard thing. It keeps you from making the bold move. So the concern, I don't know that you really need a sermon on that part. The concern comes pretty easy. <laughs> no one wakes up today and be like, well, I need to really be concerned today. I should work on that. No one really uh, has to over, you know, has to figure out how to how to concern, be concerned. That comes pretty naturally, and you can study that on your own. What I want to talk to you about today is the conflict, because it's the conflict that keeps you from doing the hard thing, and I believe that God wants us to do hard things. So I want to take a look at the story of Nehemiah, and look at the things that were presented to Nehemiah that were conflictive, that would have caused him to withdraw or to never start. And so I think there's a benefit to this, and this is one of the benefits of the Bible, is we can look at people that have gone before us, we can see the strength that they got, we can see the conflict that, they, that, that, ar that arose and how they overcame that. And so what I wanna do is I wanna show you five things that you can expect, okay? So if you're taking notes, get ready to write down five things to expect. If you're in the middle of your hard thing or you're compelled to start something hard, you need to know what to expect. And we're gonna look at these. Let's go back to verse six. six. We'll find the first one in verse six through eight. It says, so we rebuilt the wall until all of it reached half its height, for the people worked with all their heart. So they had worked a while, and the work was halfway done. Okay, we established that. The wall is halfway done. In fact, the, the, the New King James Version says it this way. The New King James says, they had a mind to work. Don't you like to hire people at your work that have a mind to work? <laughs> It says that they finished the wall. They, they got halfway done with the wall because they had a mind to work. They weren't afraid to do hard things. And, and won't you know, verse seven, something happens. 
Verse 7 says, but. Everybody say, but. But, but when Sambalat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the people of Ashdod heard that the repairs to the Jerusalem walls had gone ahead, that the gaps were being closed, they were very angry. Pause. When did the enemy get mad? When it was halfway done. When are you the most likely to quit? When you're halfway done. When you've lost 10 pounds, but you're trying to lose 20. <laughs> because here's why. The enemy takes note that you're serious this time. Before you just talked about it, but you never did anything, right? But for the first time ever, now you're actually starting something. Now you're starting to do this. And then verse eight says, they all plotted, all the enemy, they all came together and plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. Number one, if you're doing hard things, you can expect trouble. Expect it. Super encouraging so far, isn't it? Everyone's really excited about this one. Everybody say amen, yay! But we, we need to expect this. When you're concerned, okay, think about it. When you're concerned, the thing that you have mission, vision, and values for, um, that thing, when you step out to begin the work, you will always be met with conflict. Always. I know, no amens, I'll keep going. But the reason I'm saying this is not so you'll dread it, so you'll expect it. If you plan for it in advance, it's okay. You know trouble's coming and I've pre-planned and I already know that trouble's coming and I've, I've, I've prepared my mind and my heart and my soul and my emotions to expect the trouble to come. Because, and here's why, we need to understand why the enemy does this because anything worth building is what he will attack. Amen. You know, If there's an area of your life that you're not having any problems with, no trouble, then the enemy may not have any problem with it either. But if you try to start working on your marriage, guess what? He's gonna attack your marriage. If you start trying to work on your finances and becoming a better steward, that's probably the area. He's gonna attack you in the area that you're concerned most about and they're tr you're trying to overcome and do hard things towards. Uh, I, I wanna go all the way back so we know that in this moment, they're rebuilding, which means at some point it was all torn down. The, the wall, the temple, everything. Well, we need to go all the way back to when it was torn down. King Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians came and they tore down all of this stuff that they're trying to re rebuild. And I wanna take you all the way back to this moment real quick, just a quick side rabbit hole, all right, to show you why they tore it down in the first place. For 2 Kings chapter 25, verse eight, it says, on the seventh day of the fifth month and the 19th year of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, commander of the imperial army, an official of the king of Babylon came to Israel. Now watch verse nine and 10. He set fire to the temple. He could have done this to anywhere in the whole city. He decided to attack and burn down the temple of the Lord, the royal palace, and all the houses of Jerusalem. Every important building he burned down. He only attacked the important ones, the, the most important ones. Why do you think our culture is attacking the foundations of marriage? They, the enemy attacks the most important things. Right, And then verse 10 says this, the whole Babylon, Babylon, Babylonian army under the commander of the imperial guard broke down the walls around Jerusalem. Uh, my family, we go deep sea fishing. We love to go deep sea fishing. My wife, well, actually, I should, I should rephrase that. My wife will not go deep sea fishing. She doesn't wanna do that. Myself and the kids will go sometimes. And I know when we've, we've gotten down a good spot, because we start catching fish, yeah, but the real reason I know when we found the honey hole of fishing is when the sharks show up. Yeah. When we start really dragging in big red snapper over and over again, I know that it's just a matter of time before the next snapper that we bring in is only gonna have a head and nothing else. Because the sharks show up. The sharks are attracted to it because we're seeing some excess. And it's no different with the enemy. And you should expect it. You should know that when trouble starts coming, Maybe you're onto something. If you're trying to be a good steward of your money, you know what's about to happen? Your hot water tank's about to break. Yeah. You know? You know, when you start trying to serve your spouse, you know what their spouse is gonna do? They're gonna say something that makes you not wanna serve them. This is what's gonna happen. <laughs> so the enemy comes to attack us in these vulnerable moments, and it's important that we know this. And I wanna, I wanna pause just a sec second, because how Nehemiah responded to this says a lot. All right? So think about this. Your concern has led you to do hard things. You expect trouble. Trouble shows up as it did with Nehemiah. Now watch what Nehemiah did. Verse nine. But we prayed to our God and. 
Somebody say, and. and. We prayed and posted. We prayed and we posted. We did something in the supernatural, but we also did something in the natural. And I think the problem is sometimes we do one or the other, right? We're either, all we do is pray about it, but we never wanna work hard, or we work ourselves into the ground, but we've never asked God if we're working on the right thing. What Nehemiah says is it's both. We're gonna do both. We're gonna do both. We're gonna, come on, somebody say both. both. It's okay to do both. You can do both. You can, did you know that you can pray for your marriage and date your spouse at the same time? Did you know that you can pray for a new career and go back to school? You can do both. Did you know that you can pray for healing and go to the doctor? You can do both. Did you know that you can pray for mental stability and go to a counselor? You can do both. And I think this is important that when we start doing hard things, just expect conflict to come. It's coming. So what are we gonna do? We're gonna do what Nehemiah did. We're gonna pray and we're gonna post. Not post on social media. Please don't do that when conflict comes. That won't help anybody. Amen, I got an amen on that one. All right, verse 10. Let's go to the next one, verse 10. It says, meanwhile, the people in Judah said, the strength of the laborers is giving out and there's so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. Point number two, if you're doing hard things, you should expect exhaustion. Super encouraging, huh? This is such a great message. (laughs) Expect trouble, expect exhaustion. Well, it's no surprise. They've worked with all their might and the the wall has been, been built back halfway and now the enemy's attacking them. Now think about it. The enemy has not done one thing yet All they've heard is a rumor of what the enemy might do. All they've heard is a rumor that the enemy's not happy with their progress. And this is why sometimes it's not the physical work that gets you, it's the emotional. It's you laying awake at night, running through all the different scenarios and the what ifs and the what ifs and the what ifs. That's what makes you tired. If it was just physical, take a vacation, like take a day off and take a nap, right? Take a nap. But it's not, it's not just the physical. It's the physical combined with the emotional and the mental aspect of everything running around in your mind. So we should expect this. We should expect that at some point we're gonna get exhausted. And what do we do when we expect it? We plan for it. We get ahead of it, right? You, uh, uh, Pastor Jed's here. He says it all the time. And he, he got it from some leader. It's a great quote. Is you, you build a guardrail at the top of the mountain, not a hospital at the bottom of it. Like plan for it. Plan vacations in advance. If you're not taking a weekly Sabbath, you're not doing it right. You need to escape. You need to have intentional physical rest and intentional emotional rest and mental rest. Turn your email off at least one day a week. Turn your stupid phone off at least one day a week. Whatever it is that's bombarding you mentally, do this and and attack this, all right? Let's keep going, all right? We won't linger on that one. Verse 11, let's get to the next one. Verse 11 says, also our enemy said, So before they just heard about it. Now the enemy is saying, before they know it or see us, we will be right there among them. And then they reveal their plan. This is the enemy's plan. We will kill them and we will put it into the work. This is the master's, this is the enemy's plan for you, by the way. For the hard thing that you're, the the Lord's putting in your heart to do, his plan is to kill it and destroy it. We know John 10, it says the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy, like it, Jesus put it pretty plain, you know, he's good, he just kind of gave us his whole handbook. Verse 12 says, then, now think about it, it's one thing for the enemy to say it, now their own people, the Jews, it says, and the Jews who live near them came and told us 10 times over, like over and over and over again, wherever you turn, they will attack us. This is when your own friends start turning on you. The people that you thought were for you are now even coming against you, telling you that you can't do this or you can't do that or you can't do this. They're being attacked on all sides. This is when it really becomes mental. Point number three, if you're taking notes, expect a mental battle. Just expect one. 
Prepare for it. Know that it's going to be a mental battle. In sports, I grew up playing basketball and college basketball. We had guys on our team who were never going to start. They never came off the bench to score points. They came off the bench to get in the heads of our opponents. They couldn't put the ball through the hoop, but they could get inside the opponent's head. Every team needs a Draymond Green. For those of you who are following the NBA Finals right now. Because one of the greatest weapons the enemy has is, is not to do anything to you, but just to say stuff to you. Remember, the enemy hasn't done anything. At this, the enemy hadn't showed up with one sword. They haven't done anything yet. They haven't had to fight one battle. All they're doing is spitting words and threats. And it's a mental battle. It's a mental struggle over and over and over again. This is what Jezebel did to Elijah, threatened to kill him. And it, he had just called down fire on the prophets of Baal had one of the most amazing moments at Mount Carmel, flees, runs under a broom bush and prays that he might die. Why? Because the enemy just said, said something to him and threatened him. So watch the response. If, if you know a mental battle is coming, we should learn how Nehemiah responded. Nehemiah chapter four, verse 13. Therefore, that, that's an important word. They threatened me, so here's what I did. Therefore, I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall Watch this, at the exposed places, posting them by families with their swords, spears, and bows. What he's saying, this is a leadership lesson, okay? Nehemiah, it's a great leadership book. He's saying, as a leader, I took the time to identify where we were the most vulnerable. I walked around the walls of the city and said, oh, this spot right here, if we're not careful, the enemy could get through the wall here very easily. Let's reinforce it. Okay, so when you expect a mental battle, let me give you a couple examples, okay? Let's say that you're trying to overcome a lust problem, okay? Then you need to stop and know that I'm about to start a hard thing. This time I'm gonna be successful. But I know that there's some weak parts in my wall. That every time I'm alone, I do something I shouldn't do. I go to the website I shouldn't have went to. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna upload some softwares to my, to my devices. Maybe for you, I'll give you an example for me. I love, I love to stay fit, to stay, I mean, everyone's like, you're tall, it's easy for you. You don't know what I do. I work really hard to stay fit. I work out, I eat right. I, eat, I, I have no problem eating good for breakfast, piece of cake. I got no problem eating good for lunch, piece of cake. Most of the time, I got no problem eating healthy for dinner. My problem is about eight o'clock. I just take a stroll over to the pantry and my kiddos have lots of fun snacks. That's a weak part for me, right? And I don't want to discount physical health. We need to be physically healthy, all right? That's something that God can stir in our hearts to do hard things. So I don't, know, I don't know what it is for you. I don't know what challenge that you have, but Nehemiah is telling us the tactic is to come and understand the weak parts of our wall. I know I'll give you another one of mine. For me, Sundays are um, not necessarily physically exhausting, but if you've ever preached, they're, they're emotionally draining. You prepare all week, you pray up, and then you just throw it all out there, pray that it sticks, have, have an emotionally drained, you just drain yourself. Monday, you wake up and you're just like, I don't want to talk to people, I don't want to see human beings. I don't. You can, if I'm not careful, I know that, that Mondays are a low part of the wall for me. So I have to be careful not to make decisions on Mondays, because chances are I'll make a bad decision more so on a Monday than the other day. These are just examples of you need to figure out what it is in your life that's hard and know and assess the areas of your wall that are gonna be a, a weaker. Let's go on to verse 14. It says, now watch this. He, he identified the weak parts of the wall and then it says what happens next. After I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for the families, fight for your families, your sons, your daughters, your wives, your homes. Now watch this. After this decision was made to fight, they've got people at the weak points of the wall. This is what happened next in verse 15. When our enemies heard that we were aware of their plot, he's saying our enemies found out we were ready for them and that we had stationed at the weak points and that God had frustrated it, we returned to the wall and just got back to work. What he's saying is once the enemy found out that we knew his strategy was to give a mental battle and to struggle and to fight, we knew his plan, and so we knew the weak points, and so we stationed guards there to do it. The enemy was like, well, I guess we don't need to attack. The enemy never even attacked because they had preemptively 
put strongholds or things in place to overcome any sort of attack that could have came from the enemy, okay? So then the very next thing, so notice, never, never noticed this before, but from then on, okay, when I read this this time, so before they were building something a certain way, it says that they worked with all their might and they built it to half its height, okay? So that was one strategy. They just worked and worked and worked hard. But I wanna point out to you how they worked from this point forward. Nehemiah, again, it's a great leadership. He said the first way wasn't working. He stepped back, he re-strategized, and he says from now on, we're gonna work this way. And this is what, what they do in verse 16. First four words. From that day on, he says from this point forward, we're gonna do it different, and this is how we're gonna do it. Half of my men did the work, while the other half were equipped with spears, shields, bows, and armor. The officers posted themselves behind all the people of Judah who were building the wall. Those who carried the materials, think about it, how many arms do you use to carry materials usually? <laughs> the ones who carried the materials did the work with one hand and held a weapon in the other hand. They had a shovel in one hand and a sword in the other. Verse 18, and each of the builders wore a sword at his side as he worked. You know what Nehemiah discovered? If we just work really hard, but we don't protect ourselves, we're gonna burn out and we're never gonna finish this task. So let's actually slow down the work and do it with protection. Okay, if you're taking notes, write this down. When you do hard things, never put your sword down while you're doing hard things. Now, you guys are looking at me like a cow at a new gate. I thought you'd pick up on it real quick, but that's okay, because Ephesians 6 tells us how to dress for battle. Ephesians 6 says that you take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. If you're trying to do hard things, but you're not in God's Word, you are fighting with one hand tied behind your back. Don't ever, even if it slows down your work, even if you work an eight-hour day instead of a 10-hour day because you need to spend some time with the Lord first. You need to get in the Word of God first. Well, I just don't have time to get in the Word of God. Why? Because I'm so busy doing the work. I'm working with all my might, and we've reached half the height. But you know what that led to? Exhaustion. It said that we, we worked with all of our might. The wall reached half its height, and then we got discouraged, and we got exhausted. And we took our eyes off what we were building, and our eyes went to the rubble. And we didn't know how to build this thing any further. Why? Because they were fighting wrong. They were building wrong. They were building without a sword in their hand. You can't do this without the word of God. You can't do this without strength. You can't sit here and pretend like you're gonna do hard things without understanding where Nehemiah's strength came from. His strength didn't come from hard work. It came from having a, a completely dependent relationship with the Lord who was giving him supernatural grace and supernatural strength to do the work. So they fought differently. They built differently. Nehemiah chapter six, let's go to the last one here. Nehemiah chapter six, verse one. It says, when the word came to Sambalat, Tobiah, and Geshem, the Arab, and the rest of our enemies, that I had rebuilt the wall and not a gap was left. We're done. Oh, wait a minute. Though up to that time I had not set the doors in the gates. So you were done, but you weren't done. This is proof that you can actually be a believer and build something great, but leave a door open for the enemy to still get through the wall, right? So it goes on to say, verse two, it says, Sambalat and Geshem sent me this message. So think about this. Before, they had just heard about it. Then they heard rumors about what the enemy was saying to them. Now, Sambalat and Geshem are sending him direct words. Before, they were threats. Now, watch this. Sambalat and Geshem sent me this message. Come, let us meet together in one of the villages on the plains of Ono. Oh, no. You know, but they were scheming. He had discernment, but they were scheming to harm me. So I sent messengers to them with this reply. I'm carrying on a great project and I cannot go down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and go down to you? Now watch this, verse four. Four times they sent me the same message and four times I told them the same answer. So there's a lot of things you can expect, but I, wanted to, I saved the, 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 one, the last one from, from the enemy on purpose because I think it's his greatest weapon. 
So number four, if you're taking notes, you can expect distraction. First time it was just rumors. Second time it was threats. We're gonna kill you. The devil saved the best for last. It was just to distract them. If I can just get you to stop doing the work you're doing and get distracted by other things. If I can get you to just take your eye off the importance of building your marriage and make you so busy at work that you forget about working on your marriage. I think it's one of the enemy's greatest weapons. I think, in fact, sometimes the enemy allows us to find success because it becomes the greatest distraction. Your business may grow leaps and bounds, but you may be so distracted that you've forgotten all about the Lord. So distraction, there's this great book, I I encourage you to read it, C.S. Lewis wrote this great book called The The Screw Tape Letters. And it's, it's, a, it's a fiction book about him writing kind of this dialogue between Satan and his demons, and they're strategizing on how to take out Christians. And it's, it's brilliantly writ- written, and they're strategizing. And many of the book, you'll find this thread coming through the book, many of the times the enemy is telling his demons, hey, you know, just let them be. Just, just make sure that you distract them. One of the biggest weapons that he uses is just distraction. And we see this happening in this story. And we must be like Nehemiah. How did Nehemiah do this? How did Nehemiah keep his eye on the prize? I think he went all the way back to how he started the sermon in verse 12 when Nehemiah said, I had not told anyone what my God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. I had a deep concern that led me to do hard things. And God had given me a supernatural grace to do it. And when distraction came, he had the ability to have a discerning heart, to say, nope, that's a distraction. Why would I come off the wall to come and talk to you? The work I'm doing is more important than that. And we must have this gift. We must carry this trait of knowing that that, that distraction is coming and knowing that the project that God has put on us is greater and more important. So let's recap real quick. So one, we're going to expect trouble. We're gonna expect exhaustion. We're gonna expect mental battle. We're gonna expect distraction, but I know it's been discouraging so far, but let me tell you, number five, you can expect a miracle. You can expect a miracle. I know I started it by saying that God's gonna give you the strength to do hard things with no miracles, but what what I begin to discover is that as I process back through this, it's one of the greatest miracles ever. I don't know if you've ever been to Jerusalem, and the, the, the wall you see there today is not the wall that was built then as far as the, the, the structure, I mean, I'm sorry, the, the design of it and the size of it and the scope of it. But if you've ever been there and you see this wall, you realize how miraculous it would be to rebuild this thing. I mean, these, there's stones that are as big as cars. I mean, they're just unbelievable. They rebuilt this thing in 52 days. What I begin to realize is that maybe God didn't show up and move any rocks, but God just showed up and moved hearts. And God shows up and moves the hearts of ordinary men and women, and we actually become miraculous in how we carry it out. That the seed that's planted in our hearts actually is the seed for the miracle to come. But the miracle many times isn't for you. God wants to do a miracle through you. And that you, in fact, instead of waiting for God to do a miracle for you, you step up by the power of God and you become a miracle for people around you. You become the miracle. God begins to use you to do something miraculous. And the concern, think about it, the concern that led to conflict produced a miracle. All of, I know this message has been like, oh my gosh, this is so discouraging. But I want you to know that if you remove any of these elements, you lose the miracle. It is the concern. Overcoming the conflict that produced the miracle. We can do hard things. Not in our own power, not in our own strength. Nehemiah didn't wait for a miracle. God used him to become the miracle. And we can do hard things. We can do extraordinary things, not because we're that good, but because we're leaning into the same God who gave the strength to Nehemiah. And we're learning that in this season. He's the same God, yesterday, today, and forever. I can lean into the strength that Nehemiah got. I can lean into the strength that Gideon got. I can lean into the strength that David got. I can lean into the strength that Nehemiah got because God supernaturally gives us the strength to do what he's calling us to do. One more thing I wanna show you 
Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 17. I love this part. It says, then I said to them, you see the trouble that we're in. Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been burned with fire. So pause. What has just happened is he just got done saying, just a couple of verses later in verse 12, I didn't, hadn't told anybody up to this point about what God had put in my heart for Jerusalem. So God had deposited this concern in his heart. And now what we see fleshing out here is he's now going to the people and sharing with them his concern, as any good leader does. Visionary leaders, they have a concern, they pray through it, they get a plan for it, and then they have to go and lead people through it. So you see this leadership trait coming out in him. And so in this moment, he's talking to the people, and then he says to the people, come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem, and we will no longer be in disgrace. And this part is so important to this journey and this story in verse 18. He said, I also told them about the gracious hand of my God on me. He's like, I want you to know that this plan that I have is something that God put in my heart, and it's not me that's gonna do it. God has given me a supernatural grace to do it. We talked about this last week. If you missed last week's message, you need to go back and, and listen to it or watch it. Grace is not just salvation, and I'm thankful that it covers salvation. We, we, we have the grace of God. We are saved, set free, redeemed. But if you study this word grace deeper, you will find that grace is so much bigger than just salvation. Grace is God's empowerment. Grace is God's wisdom. Grace is, is God's discernment on your life. It's the thing that you need to do anything. That when God's grace rests on the hard thing that you're doing, it is what you need. It is what gives you the strength to build a boat when the waters don't part. It is what gives you the strength to know how to raise a teenager when you have no idea how to raise a teenager. It is the thing that lets you build your business to the next level when you don't know how to build your business to the next level. It's the thing that shows you and guides you and directs you on what to say to your spouse when things are so inflamed you don't know how to proceed from this part. If you try to do hard things without the grace of God, you will fall flat on your face. And that's what Nehemiah is saying. He's saying, I want you to know that we're gonna succeed in this really hard task because God's hand of grace is on my life. And I wanna, I wanna pray for you today. In just a moment, we're gonna go back into worship. We've budgeted time for this. We're doing great on time. What I wanna do is I know that there's people here that one, you're either doing hard things right now or there's something speaking to your heart in the same way that God spoke to Nehemiah's heart, compelling you to do something hard. You're concerned about something. There's something deeply concerning in you and you know that there's conflict there and you don't know how to proceed. Either way, my approach today and what I believe God's gonna do supernaturally is that he may not show up and do a miracle and fix all your problems, but I do think he'll show up and do something miraculous today and deposit grace on your life. He will come and just put what you need for right now to have the strength to get through the hard thing. He'll give you discernment. He'll give you strength. He'll give you empowerment. He'll give you wisdom. He'll give you knowledge. He'll give you understanding when you don't know what decision to make and where to go. God wants to come and deposit this on our life today. So I'm gonna call. I'm gonna do this for Edmund too. Edmund's joining us still. I wanna call for two quick responses, okay? And, and when I ask you the question, I want you to respond by showing your hand. Uh, the first thing I wanna ask is if you're here today and you're in the middle of doing something really hard, really, really hard, and you, you, you can identify with the story of Nehemiah. It says that they had worked and it had reached half its height and they're tired and they're exhausted and they're looking at the rubble going, I don't know how we're gonna finish this project. You're in the middle of doing something really hard. I want you to raise your hand real high. Yeah, Edmund, raise your hand real high. Hands going up all, all over the place. All right, you can put your hand down. The second thing I wanna call the response for is if you're here today or at the Edmund campus today or watching online today and you would say there's something that is before me that is so daunting that I don't even know how to start but there's something just like Nehemiah, you haven't really told a whole lot of people about the thing that God has put on your heart concerning that hard thing. He's just deposited something there and if, he's, if you feel shame about it, it, that's not how the Holy Spirit works, okay? So if you feel like something's beating you over the head, that's not the Holy Spirit because he doesn't work that way. 
He's a gentleman. It's a nudge. It's just a real tender, lays something on your heart, steps back. It causes a genuine concern. And then it's conflict that keeps you from progressing forward. So if you're here and God is putting something on your heart, I don't care what it is. I don't care how big it is or how small it is. It may be you need to call somebody and just have that conversation. I don't know what it is. It's a hard thing. But you feel like the Holy Spirit is nudging you to move forward and do the hard thing. I want you to shoot, shoot your hand up for that one. Yeah, hands up all over again. All right. If you're at the Edmond campus or if you're here at the OKC campus, if you raise your hand for either of those questions, I want you to stand to your feet right now. Just stand up. You won't be the only one, trust me. Just stand up. This does not mean you've done anything wrong. It does not mean that you, you've done anything. It just means that God is prompting you to do something hard or you're just exhausted. You're in the middle of doing something hard. So in just a moment, we're gonna go back into a worship song. And what I'm gonna ask you to do or invite you to do, you don't have to do this. There's nothing magical about coming down front. But I wanna invite you, if you want to, to come down front for prayer, okay? And so... I'm gonna ask the prayer team. Now, if you're on the prayer team and you stood up, you don't necessarily need to come forward and serve. But if you're on staff or if you're on the prayer team, I'm gonna ask you to just come forward here and at Edmund, just move out of your seat, come forward and stand along the front, right in front of the uh, altar and face outward. So in just a minute, I'm gonna ask you, if you raise your hand, I'm gonna ask you to leave your seat, come down forward. Again, you don't have to do this, it's an invitation. I'm gonna jump off the stage, Pastor Wade's gonna jump off there and we're gonna come down and just pray. And here's what we're praying for. Okay? I don't mind if you pray that God does a miracle. That's cool. I don't mind you doing that. What we're praying for is that God would give you supernatural strength, that grace would come upon your life supernaturally. And we're gonna worship, okay? So I'm gonna pray corporately. When I say amen, if you haven't already came down front, this is your prompt. When I say amen or right now, you can just begin to come down. And if, if prayer teams are full, that's okay. You can lift your hands to God and worship and wait for somebody to pray for you. And if nobody prays for you, that's okay too. You're just responding and saying, God, you're, doing, you're, you're challenging me to do hard things and I need your grace. So Father, we come to you right now in the next few moments and what I ask and what I pray is that you would make a deposit in us today, a grace a grace, God, to overcome, a strength to, to do the hard thing that's in front of us. We thank you that you're gonna work, work in us today, that we're gonna leave different than we came, and we worship you and we pray in just a moment. We thank you for it. We worship you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's pray for just a moment. Thank you for joining us here today for this week's message. And here at Victory Church, we are called to equip people to live in His presence, move beyond ourselves, and be transformed. And this can only happen through your radical generosity, your serving, and your prayers. If this message or any of our messages have impacted your life and you would like to partner with us by giving into this ministry, you can do so by visiting our website at victory.church/give. Thank you again for joining us and have a great day.